It takes effort, takes courage, takes courage to fight fear. Yeah. It takes courage to have more courage than you have fear. Then you start to get that balance in your favor. So let's change that from freeze, flee, fight to freeze, flee, face. Face it. I face love it. on. I love it. Face. But I also want to acknowledge that sometimes flee is the correct thing to do. It absolutely is. If there is danger, if there's danger of, we have that from, you know, prehistoric times when a wild animal was going to devour us. Absolutely. We have that when we are at, you know, going to cross the street and we look both ways. Hopefully they, you do, because we have survival instincts. I'm not saying suppress that. I'm saying, no, I'm not saying invest in every single, you know, crazy person that proposes something to you. I don't say yes to everything because I look into it a bit and I go, okay, I do due diligence. Welcome to Gratitude Geek. I'm Candice Fidardi. Today I'm joined by Jean Omlor, a business coach who went from deep debt to making millions all while helping others reach their goals and live their best lives. Welcome, Jean. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So tell us the story. Tell us about that pivotal moment when you decided to shift your mindset from lack to abundance. Okay, well, I don't know if there was a pivotal moment where I decided to do that, to be honest. I love that people have that, but I didn't have that, you know, lightning thunder saying, oh my goodness, I have to shift my thinking. This happened over the years. And, you know, it's bit by bit, I think, shifting thinking, right? Um, our, years ago, I remember years and years ago, when I realized that I thought I didn't deserve to be wealthy, I cried or that I didn't deserve to have money. That was many years ago. That was the first part. Then it gets to another part. But the point about being deep in debt, that was five years ago. And I'm a solo parent. And I woke up, I did wake up one morning. That's true. And I had what's called a defining moment. I always wanted those. <laughs> I had a defining moment. And I thought, oh my goodness, I really, really need to get, get, get back. And I, I need to make this work. And I need to find something new and I need to get online because all of that till then had been offline. And I just thought, if not now, when? So that was the pivotal moment. So up until five years ago, you were not doing your, you weren't working online. You weren't. I wasn't online. I was a coach, but I was doing, I mean, online, I had a website, but I mean, I wasn't getting clients through social media. I was oh. getting clients in the old way of networking events and meeting people and all that hard stuff where you have to dress up, put makeup on, nice clothes, drive to a networking event, talk to a bunch of people that are not your market, maybe find one that is, get a card, follow up, maybe get all of that hard stuff that kept me poor. Yeah. Eight years. Right. Yeah. And five years ago, I thought I, 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 this is not working for the where I was living, the market. I had a great offer, but not the right people. Like, you know, selling the wrong thing, not ice to Eskimos because they needed it. That's different. Ice to Eskimos. They, 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 they don't need the ice. The people needed it, but didn't know that. Okay. Mm. It's different. Yeah. So then I just, yeah. And part of me, you know, part of me somewhere in my consciousness, somewhere back there knew that I was meant to be super, super successful. And I knew I was meant to be a millionaire. Isn't that funny? We always say, I want to be a millionaire. And I was like, I'm meant to be a seven figure coach. Why is this not happening? Jean? Oh, got to do other things. So that was the pivotal moment was five years ago. I woke up and thought, if not now, when learn so this stuff. So that was before the pandemic, before the pandemic, thank God. <laughs> So you were ready to go when it started. I was already positioned. I would, people were already seeing the value. And I was like, oops, for a split second, I thought, what? I finally am, you know, really, you know, becoming really successful. And I thought, wait, they need me more now. They need to be online creating their businesses. So the pandemic did not hurt me. So let's talk about being a single parent. So how did that, how did that help you approach your successful business building? Uh, well, it's great because you have no choice. Your back's up against a wall every single day and there's no choice. There's no room for doubt. There's no room for how does it feel? No, there's no room for that. And that's a gift. That is a gift. Actually, you just go. There is no, for me, losing time meant no food on the table. I can't do that. So it makes things very essential. And I believe in essentialism. I believe that we process too much and we think about things too much. And I didn't have time for that. And fast tracked me. I'm like, whoa, okay, I can't doubt because doubting means no money, no food on table, stop the doubt, just do. So it's a gift. And also it gets rid of the all ego, all ego. There's no room for ego when you just have to make things happen. And it's kind of a pure energy because it's like, I got to make this happen. I'm taking care of the because I'm doing this. There's no room 
for nonsense. You know, uh, about 10 years ago, I, ha- I was having a conversation with, I'm married, I have a child, right? And I was having a conversation with a couple of other women that were married that have children. We were all commiserating because there's so many success stories about women, single parent women who've had such, so much, you know, huge success. But there aren't any success stories about moms, the married moms and their success. <laughs> I mean, we oh, no, oh, no, no, there but, are. But, but, there but are. we were literally commiserating about it. The, the, but that was a mindset. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Because there are many, many colleagues of mine who are married with children that are more successful than I am. And there's power in the fact you have a partner supporting you emotionally, if they are. That's why it's called a power couple, right? So I was told, actually, this is the the ironic part. And I want to say this as a mind shift. When I first started coaching, I was just like, I I had a one-year-old and a four-year-old. Okay. I was already separated. I was in New York city. It was a hustle. And I actually, to this day, I try to figure out how I got through that. I can't even like, remember how I like how, and people at the time were saying, how do you do that? I'm like, Oh, I just do it. But I look back now, my life is like a vacation every day. Now, literally it's like a vacation. Some people say you're working hard now. I'm like, you have no idea. Yeah. I don't work hard. I work just well. I love it. I remember I had a first coach and I, I'd done like a group thing and we'd get on these things. She was nice. And she actually said, without thinking that I was on that call, because she knew I was a newly solo parent. She goes, well, you know, you know, people that don't have a spouse or a partner, it's really hard for them to become successful. <gasps> and I remember thinking, I can't believe you just said that. Right. Mm-hmm. And I thought, no, it's, I thought, No, it's not. Sure. It is easier to have a power couple thing. She literally said that. Then I think she realized I was on that call and thought, "Uh uh-oh, what did I just say? And I thought, how could you say that? And I thought, that is not true. And I'm going to prove to you, because studies have shown that it's easier to be, it's true. Studies have shown it is easier to become successful if you're in a good relationship where there's support. There's power together in numbers. There is. Yeah. I just thought I'm going to do it. So no, I had a handicap. Let's be real. I had a handicap. Mm-hmm. You did. I did. Mm-hmm. But, you, made- but you, you did something that a lot of women in your position might not have done. And that was you joined a group. I joined I mean, lots even, of groups. Even though she was, even though she, was uh, she misspoke yes. during that meeting, you still yes. were there in a group with other women. I was in a group with other people. And with by the people. way, anybody else... The power of suggestion is so strong. I had to go and clean my mind after hearing that. Yeah. I thought, whoa, I have to go now. It wasn't, it wasn't a gift for me. I had to go and think, no, that I don't believe that. Let's just wash your mind. That was suggested to my subconscious and my conscious right there. Studies have shown. I'm like, well, okay, well, uh, studies are going to show me being successful lady. Yeah. You know, and I had no money then. I didn't know what I was doing. She was literally helping me get my website up. That's the very beginning. Oh. It was literally wow. the beginning stages of my business. And she did give me feedback on my banner on my website. That's how beginner I was. Okay. Wow. I was not, I thought, oh my gosh, how could she say that? And I thought that's just, okay, well, I'm okay. Thank you. It's going to be harder, but what, you, what do you suggest? I go find another person? No, that's not going to happen. So I need to make this work. So I believe it does not matter. There's all sorts of other things and studies and blah, blah, blah. You know, we got to stop making excuses for where we are. Just it's going to work if you want it to work no matter what. That's what I believe. Right? We are in the middle of a very volatile political political year across the globe. Lots of things going on yes. in politics. And this is what I know about truth. What is true for me might not be true for you. Yes. And what is true for you might not be true for for me, but they're both true. Exactly. And the thing is this, this is the other thing that's very true. And this, you're going to laugh. This is where I'm, how far my mindset is. People are starting to murmur online. Oh, nobody's paying high ticket anymore. Well, I don't see that as truth. I see that as not true because yeah. people do pay me high ticket because I'm a high ticket coach. And one person was trying to convince me, oh, you better change it to low ticket. I said, why would I do that? Like it, it Why would I do that lady? But then she tried to make me pay her high ticket because she thinks the high ticket doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. There's illogic going on there, right? Yeah. But then after she said that, I started getting more higher ticket clients than I've ever gotten in my whole career ever during whatever is going on. I don't listen to that. Oh, the politics. We know if you look at trends, there's always going to be a recession every few years. There's going to be a bubble bursting. 
if you don't look at history of the last few years and blah, 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 I mean, I don't know what to say, really. It's just people making excuses because they don't want to do what it takes to be successful. I'm sorry. So, that's what I think. I network online mm -hmm. a lot. And the financial planner in my BNI chapter, he likes to explain over and over again that during the third quarter of the four year presidential cycle, that is usually when the market is the lowest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are in the third quarter of the yes. fourth year of the yes. presidential cycle. So, of course, the market's going to be weird this. I mean, it's doing really, really, really well this year, but over the last hundred years, it's exactly. this has traditionally been a very poor time for the market, which means it's a great time to buy stock. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you buy the right stock, you know, if, you the right if, stock. You, if, 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 yeah, if, if, but, if, you if. Know, it's funny, all the financial, if you have, a, if you have the right advisor. Well, the thing is this, you, if you know about looking into past trends, it's just a cycle. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to get all upset, because there is a, there's a cycle in everything with our bodies, with the sun, with the moon, with seasons, with everything, there's cycles. But if people just want to like see it, that every day is going to be the same no matter what, I don't know what to say. It's just not smart. Yeah. But I don't care about cycles because I'm me. I create my own cycles. Like I created the, my own success against a lot of odds. Yeah. So when you get to that level where there's zero excuses, I have a zero excuse life. There's reasons why I couldn't do something if I get sick. That's a reason. It's not an excuse, right? Or, or a reason if I'm doing something. But there's no excuses. I make zero excuses. When you get to a zero excuse life, those trends don't even matter anymore because you are zigging when everybody else is zagging and that's what you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Do the opposite of what you think other people want you to do. That's how, I've, uh, that's how I've always looked at life. Okay, so you said something a little bit ago. You talked about how you tuned out the mind clutter. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? What's your process for that? It's simple. Just stop. <laughs> people laugh. <laughs> People laugh when I say it. it's a little bit like Joe Dispenza, his thing of change. Like I love Joe Dispenza's meditations and I started doing them and he goes, change. I thought, oh, that's exactly like my stop. It's just a different word. I worked this out years ago. Again, why do we have to process so much? When somebody starts saying me, to me, I have to go process that. I'm, I'm out. That means all sorts of things for me. Excuses of why, why I can't do this. I, I just have to go process this. If they say, hey, you know what? Give me overnight just to get through this and process it. Sure. But I have to go away and process. That's just a bunch of it. Bundle excuses. A bundle of excuses. Let me go. I'm like, we're done. You know? Yeah. Or, or it's just an excuse of why they don't want to work. And that's fine. People don't want to work with me, but I just say no. Not, I have to go. I can take it. You don't want to do it. Okay, why? Great. But I have to go process this. The longer you process stuff, the less successful you are. That is a, that has been studied. Well, the definition of process is yeah. to process rather than to make a process, but to actually process something as you, you break it down into icky stuff. I mean, processed foods are bad. <laughs> yeah, no, they you mean know. in my mind, I got to process yeah. all. Why? Because we are such wusses now. I mean, we are such over, look, I am known as an oversensitive personality. Like I, I, I get it. However, I don't go, oh, I'm oversensitive. I'm like, you know what? We need to process things more quickly and stop being such darn wusses. Like I, well, we can't I, say we're, we're canceled if we say anything that people don't like anymore. You know, like there's, there's, there, it's getting to a point where people can't even speak their minds anymore. Right. Cause you're canceled. Cause you don't like, you just said it. Your, your truth for me is da da da, right? I get yeah. you. I, I agree. Yeah, but I, I believe in attracting the people that you, I believe in repelling the people that are bad for, to be, for you to be around and attracting the people that are good for you. I agree. If they want to cancel you, fine. Cancel me. Yeah. But the point, I'm not saying to be obnoxious. I'm never yeah. obnoxious online. I'm very respectful. And I, I, I treat everybody with love online. And I, you know, I, do, I, do, I do what I think is the right thing out there in the world and not insult people. Okay. But what I mean is, it takes very little to insult people now. Like, it's mm. just, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. guys, we got to get tougher about what matters. Like, like what I mean is if somebody doesn't want to work with me, I, I process that in three seconds. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to go process. Oh my gosh, they didn't want to work with me. It's done. You know, okay, great. I got it. <laughs> We're done next. Right. That's what I mean is these setbacks. We don't, we shouldn't be taking so long because you're wasting your lifetime. Just, Process it and move on is what I'm saying. 
Yeah, and if you, it, you're right, the longer you process it, the less likely you are to actually pull the trigger. Um, I like the word percolate rather than process because when right, you percolate, right. you add heat. Got it. I get it. Yeah. Whatever um, you're going to do, I love it. Just, you know, get over it quickly, please. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever yeah. that word is, fine. <laughs> you know, find the word. Um, but yeah, so uh, to me, if they say I have to process this, it usually is a no. So, you know, right. the, the maybes kill you. Well, the thing is, I would never say to somebody, I just have to process. I, I'd say, hey, I got to think this over and get to my decision. Boom. That's true. I got to think this over. Give, give me, we do need to think. It's like, oh, there needs to be a decision-making process in life, right? But but how long, oh, I've been processing this for a year, you know, or I'm not just talking about sales. I'm talking about everything. Yeah. We don't need to process our emotions so much. We need yeah. to. Because then you get, can't get out of those emotions. Exactly. You're stuck in them. You're stuck. And that's that's when, you know, people uh, confuse fear with intuition all the time. Okay. Mm. All the time. I met uh, uh, an intuition PhD expert and she said, do you know, I wrote an ebook on that. You're correct. That people think that intuition is intuition, but it's actually their fear holding them back. And she wrote an ebook on how to tell the difference. That's how common that is. Wow. Okay? Dig into that deeper. Well, this is the thing. In your brain, you have what's called synapses, okay? And you're creating this habit, okay? Now, if you have a habit of going into a fear cycle, okay? And, and it's like, oh, I need to make a decision. You go into fear and then you're like, okay, I'm going to go in and I'm going to process that, okay? Then they, 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 they confuse that process of going around and around in their brain and their fears going around and around and around, thinking it over and over and go, oh, you know what? I don't think this is a good idea. It is not intuition. It is them merely tapping into their habit of going around and around like a broken record of fear, but justifying the fear and calling it intuition or a feeling of, oh no, I have a gut feeling. No, people have lost all contact with what is really truly a gut feeling sometimes. Because, well, the, 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 th yeah. the three responses to fear are freeze, flee or fight right or, or go into your fear body of well, that's processing freeze that's freezing but yeah. they don't think it's freezing they think it's processing it's literally and then it validates it so then okay let's say you say to me hey jean uh can you want to invest in this xyz i'm like okay i get fearful oh my gosh what if i lose something what if i it's not going to be a good idea i lost in the past uh, let me just process that and I'll get back to you. So then I go and I start overthinking. Well, you know, I don't know if I invest in that XYZ, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. What if I lose the money? Let me just justify that. Okay. Now I did that before I lost it. I think I better be safe. So yeah, my gut feeling, which is really just a fear, blah, blah, blah. My gut feeling is I'm not going to invest in this. Now I'm not saying the investment was good or bad. I don't know. I'm just using an example. Okay. So I'm very, very careful when I make any kind of investment, whether that's in real estate or blah, 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 to, to think, hmm, now why am I not doing this? Let me see logically the numbers work. Okay. Is it because I actually just don't trust that person? That's a gut feeling then, right? Mm -hmm. hmm. Then I'm like, okay, there's the person. I better look into that person then a bit, right? All right. Now I've made investments that look great and by random, whatever, they just didn't work out. That does not mean it would it could not have been a good investment. That's just life. And then something happened. Yeah. All right. It's not like, Oh, darn it. I knew I shouldn't have done that because many of the investors all thought it was a good investment and they're smarter than me just was bad luck because luck comes into it. So I'm saying this thing, and I used to do this and I used to think it was intuition. I realized it was just a fear body. That's a groove of synapses going around and around and around and around. And then it's, yep, yeah, not doing this. Okay. It gets to the point where you never do anything because your fear is so vast that any action is fearful. And you're saying my intuition, it's not aligned. Well, it's not aligned because you're so tapped into your fear body that nothing's going to be aligned ever. Yeah. And you are going to be stuck forever, never taking a risk because we do need to take risks. We do. So what do you say to that person who, who needs, I mean, you said it earlier, do it, just start, just, right. just do it. But there aren't, there are people who aren't in that mindset. So well, help them you, get out of it. Okay. You need to really be real with yourself. Am I just in denial about this? Is it because some part of us kind of knows we're, eh, you know, unless they're so deep, 
Oh, and then they justify why they're not doing something that that truly is clearly would have been a good decision. And then at that point, I'm like, well, they're too far under fear. I can't help them make this decision. And I'm not going to force people. Some people go, you're right. That was fear. You're right. Okay. Um, and, and and they're like, they're they, they are open enough to, to admit that they're in denial about this sort of semi-denial. So I would say, if you are not moving forward because you are so afraid of investing in a coach or an opportunity, then I would say, okay, what's going on here? I'm not moving forward. I'm too full of fear to move forward. What do I want the most? Do I want to just stay in my fear and say I'm in a comfort zone? It's never comfortable. Or do I truly want to move forward and figure out what your priority is? And if your priority is just keeping the status quo going and feeling crappy about yourself for the rest of your life because you're never going to be self-actualized, then do that. But if you're like, no, I really want to move forward and I'm going to get past this fear to make a decision, whatever that is, to move forward by taking some risk. Some risk has to happen because you cannot grow with no risk. It's just a fact. You can't grow with no risk. Risk of doing stuff that's scary, right? Risk of spending money to get help. Risk of losing a little bit of the footing with our, you know, comfiness to then be a little unstable, things, great things happen. And then you get back to stability. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 And back to the fear thing, the three responses to fear, freeze, mm -hmm. flee, or fight. Yes. Right. The people who want you who need to be successful are the ones that are fighting, right? They've, they're fighting against the, the thing that makes them scared. Um, you know, it's different word verbiage. I don't think anything's a fight. I think it's moving forward. Face it, facing it head on. Yeah, yes, exactly. Facing your fear. Yes. To me, it is about facing the fear. Like, okay. And we know when we're finally not hiding. And yeah. we might do peripheral things that make us feel good and get us a little further, but it's going to take forever. And when you say, like when I woke up that morning and I thought, do you know how hard that was for me to climb that mountain of learning something completely new from scratch? That's my biggest like, oh gosh, I got to do that again. And we all have that. And I keep doing that. And I'm like, okay, get ready. Another mountain. But I know what I'm facing. And I'm like, I will do it. It takes effort, takes courage, takes courage to fight fear. Yeah. It takes courage to have more courage than you have fear. Then you start to get that balance in your favor. So let's change that from freeze, flee, fight to freeze, flee, face. Face it. I face it. on. I love it. But I also want to acknowledge that sometimes flee is the correct thing to do. It absolutely is. If there is danger, if there's danger of, we have that from, you know, prehistoric times when a wild animal was going to devour us. Absolutely. We have that when we are at, you know, going to cross the street and we look both ways. Hopefully they, you do because we have survival instincts. I'm not saying suppress that. I'm saying, no, I'm not saying invest in every single, you know, crazy person that proposes something to you. I don't say yes to everything because I look into it a bit and I go, okay, I do due diligence, but I don't do, like, I believe what, you know, um, what was his name? You know, the guy that was the secretary of state that was in the Bush administration and he was administration and he also wrote leadership books. Gosh, Colin Powell. Oh, Colin yes. Powell. His thing, and I didn't know that this was his thing. I was doing this anyway. He said, when you have between, I think it was 40 and 70% of the information is that is when you make a decision. If you wait till you try to get a hundred, it's too late. People yeah. are dying. Yeah. Okay. Especially in, in the situation of the military when you're, yes. yeah. Yeah. But then he wrote books on this in leadership. And I realized when you are like, I have to get all the information, you never have all the information. You never will. Yeah. It's not possible to have 100% of the information. And if you think you're going to get it, well, you're living in La La Land. And that's where your intuition does come through. It's like, okay, I have 70, and I, I've always made decisions that way. That I have, that's enough information. I get it. I'm never going to have it all anyway. Now the intuition comes in of my gut feeling. Mm -hmm. Okay. But those people that ask you, like, Keep asking many, 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 many questions are never going to take, ever going to take action 
ever because they are stuck. Yeah. I just want to have all the information. Okay, I'll give you all the, then they keep asking more. I'm like, whoa, I'm exhausted and I don't want those clients because I, 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 I literally said to one person, I literally cannot, three calls, I said, I can't even answer another question because it, it's just this the fear cycle. They, and then they started asking the same questions over and over again. I thought, okay, hey, this is the fear cycle. I'm like, you know, I'm done. Yeah. That's not going to be a good coaching client. Yeah. That's going to be somebody so and, full of fear that and, it's going to be impossible to coach. Good for you for identifying that and stopping the process. Of course. I see that right away. Maybe that's what they needed. God bless them. They got to go figure that out on their own. If if they, they have to go fix that themselves, I can't do it. And my, my goal when people come and coach with me is make them successful. Maybe they should go to a therapist first. You know, mm. I don't know. And I, I'm, I say that with love because yeah. therapy is invaluable. So no, it, it's like, it's like, you can't know everything when you're going to be like, you, you know, you know what I mean? Like how much information can I give you at this point? Like exactly what you're going to do every single day and the results. I need a crystal ball for that. Right. There has to be some trust when you buy something. When I buy a car, I have to have some trust that it's not going to break down tomorrow mm -hmm. or I wouldn't buy it. Yeah. There is some trust, right? Yeah. So Set it up so that you are buying the car from someone you can trust, right? Well, I mean, I bought it from Tesla. You know, I bought it from Tesla, but it could still break down. You know? <laughs> we'll just leave that one. We'll leave that one on the, on the back burner. I, I said that on purpose because I knew that that would get a charge from you. Right? I, knew that would, I, knew, I knew just the brand would get a, a you know, rise out the, of it. The thing about a, a brand like Tesla, though, is that they are so... They are disruptors. I mean, they have changed yeah. the way cars are made. And there is no other car company making cars the way Tesla makes cars. That's because they're not a car company. They're a battery company that built cars around it. That's true. That is true. And they, they are did, now a car company. They yes. did try to make their battery available to other car manufacturers, but none of the other manufacturers wanted it, which I thought was really interesting, that the other manufacturers would want to make their own battery. Well, I, then, then who knows? All sorts knows? of political or yeah i know it's very or, or, or it, that, even uh yeah it could also be even um economical maybe it's cheaper for them to go develop their own who knows or who maybe knows? they don't want to be associated or maybe yeah. they don't want him to control anything about their businesses yeah and which is fair yeah it's very fair it's very very fair um but it, the, the thing is there um so tesla and spacex are you know all in the elon musk globe Yes. And when SpaceX was testing their rockets a few years ago, they would celebrate the failures. Exactly. Yes. And, you know, when you look at it, this is the other thing. I wish people would just do a bit more research on, on success. No person ever got hugely successful without failing a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A the lot. more you fail, the more you succeed. Right. And so, you know, it's like just par for the course. Also, investors all know that they don't make 10 investments that are all successful investments. They're lucky if seven are, and they celebrate. If seven out of the 10 are successful, they're like, wow, we're winning. Mm -hmm. So this thing of amateur thinking of that everything I need to do and everything I invest in has to be a success. That's just not reality. That's la la land. I've lost a lot of money on investments, but I've got some other good investments. I've lost a lot of money on bad coaches. I mean, I invest a lot. I mean, I, I think I wasted about $95,000, but I've made so much money. It's all good, yeah. right? It's about, it's not about being small-minded about every single thing needs to have exactly the same amount of, it's not how life works. It has to be, you just keep testing. You win some, you lose some, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, the statistic with baseball is a 300 batting average is excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that you missed it 700 times, right? Absolutely. <laughs> you know? right. Are they going, oh my goodness, I the 700, oh boo hoo, no. You know what I mean? It's like, wow, I'm running really well in my coaching business and I did lose some money. Oh, well, I'd rather be doing really well and, and made some mistakes, but made some, why don't we talk about the good stuff? That's where gratitude comes in and thinking about, we always hear, oh, that didn't, you know, that didn't work. Okay, now tell me what did work. Oh, oh, hang on. All the things that did work, are way more, way more than the things that did not work. You're winning. Mm -hmm. It's a negative 
add it, you know, the half, half full, half empty, you know, yeah. pick, pick how you want to operate in your life. Well, the other thing that's true. So I send thank you cards to all of my podcast guests. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because it just happened this week. Um, so I, a recent guest on the show posted a picture of the thank you card and talked about how he's going to put it in his, his, you know, his, you know, photo album and, and that, mm -hmm. that he's really, he'll, he'll always remember the episode because of, of the card. Right. Mm -hmm. And somebody posted under there, I bet only five, only 0.5% of podcast hosts send thank you cards. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the statistic is actually 3% of businesses send thank you cards. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the 97% of businesses that don't send the thank you cards aren't successful. It just no. means that 3% of businesses care enough about their clients to send a thank you card. Or, 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 or have the bandwidth or the, the help to do it. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So the, the, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because there are many ways to get to success. Mm-hmm. So you have helped over 400 businesses. Almost 500 now. Almost actually. 500 now. So share a success story that might be outside the box. Outside the box. Um, I'm making dinner one evening and I start a conversation like chatting messages with this other lovely coach and she's eating dinner at the same time. And she's hearing me stir the pots and I'm hearing her chomp and we're chatting a bit. She sends me photos of her dog. I'm like, yeah, she looks at my stuff. She goes, Hey, I'm going to sign up with you. Just let me finish dinner and I'm going to pay you in full. Okay. No sales calls, nothing. She just took a look intuitively. She thought this is the one. I love that she's cooking dinner. I love, you know, she just thought you're the one. She goes, just give me a second. I'm going to finish dinner and I'm going to give you my credit card. And then, uh, you know, I don't need a sales call. I want you to coach me. I said, great. Perfect. Love it. Comes in, does everything I say, coached well. And she got to $91,000 in four weeks. Wow. Where did she start? She was made, well, she'd been coaching four years and I think she said the most she ever did was like 7K months. Yeah. Wow. And then she, she said, this was beyond my expectations. So I never, I thought I didn't need this help or this or that did the work. And she had two other stellar months as well. So do you see what I'm saying is like, things don't always have to be so neat that the, the, the best part of that story was how she signed up. Mm -hmm. Right. It was just, you're in. She goes, she'd been around enough. She's like, this is the woman. And she liked, I was interested in her dogs. And, you know, she liked the fact I was just like, hey, I'm cooking dinner and, you know, like, like leaving messages that it wasn't like, oh, now we're going to like have a conversation. Now we have to get on a call. And she's like, yep, you're it. I'm, I'm in. I said, okay, cool. Love it. That both of those are facing the fear and being authentic. I mean, you were being your authentic self. She was being her authentic self. Exactly. So Yes. You already knew. You didn't have to get past the pretense. You already knew what to expect from each other. Well, she had looked at my content, saw what I was speaking about, thought this is, this is authentic to me. Okay. Authentic, authentic, authentic. Right. She loved it. And she also said to me, I'm going to pay you in full because I want my clients to pay me in full from now on. Yes. And she got her first 18 K in full payments ever. Wow. I helped her also raise her prices. And she said, you gave me the courage to actually say, hey, you want to pay in full for $18,000, which had never happened to her before. Wow. So there's, she's smart enough to know you operate the way you want things to happen. My aunt would say, model the desired behavior. That's exactly what she did. And she also knew quick decision-making makes quick decision-making. She didn't go, oh, gee, Jean, I love what you're doing, but, 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 and then maybe we'll get on it. But she, she didn't want that attraction and she got it and it worked. I loved it because I thought this person is so smart and she was just a quick decision maker. Yeah. And that's what she got, quick decision makers. Wow. Okay. So you are relatively new to marketing online within the last five years. Yes. So share your favorite marketing, online marketing tips. Okay. So really it's so simple. People compl they complicate everything. It really is being yourself. It is not looking at other people and going, Oh, I'm going to be like her. And I, again, I didn't have space for that. Remember the no space. I just messy. Some, some sort of person that wasn't so kind said, Oh, I get it. We just sort of show our mess online and we make millions of dollars. She said that. Cause you, you know, you get the haters. And I said, yeah, I just said, yep, that worked. Yep. <laughs> I'm just like, yep, that that's it kind of thing. Meaning, you know, hashtag unfake. I love that yeah. hashtag. I made that up. Hashtag unfake. That's a it's great like, hashtag. 
Isn't it though? You can use that. Just say Jean Amlor taught me this. The thing is also hashtag unmediocre. Okay. So to me, it's about essence, essential stuff. It is not bending yourself into a pretzel to make people like you because they won't because they'll feel it's not real. So instead of the word authentic, let's just be true blue and real. Let's just be real. So here's what happened. And I am not saying you need to tell everybody every inch of your personal life because that is not cool. Yeah. You need to keep your personal life. You, you, you don't want to tell people everything. There is a private garden that we need to keep for ourselves. So I don't tell people everything, but I tell them personal stuff that is appropriate, that is going to help them. And I also don't, uh, you know, use things out of vulnerability to then use it as a tool. Yeah. Because there's this vulnerability that people are using that's vulnerability, sorry, uh, using it to get views. No, that's fake then. It's hashtag fake. So yeah. basically be yourself. Yeah. Be yourself. Just write posts that are true about what's going on with you and your clients. Stories are good, right? Show results. Don't be afraid to show results. I am not bashful about showing my results. In fact, I don't show them enough. You know, we have so many wins. I'm like, oh, I forgot to do that. Yeah, but, it, that is a woman problem, though. I think a lot of women have trouble with that. I think it's just I forget, to be honest. Mm. But I do agree with you. Some, or are you, are you very busy? I, w women do forget because they feel like, oh, but I don't want to brag. You're not bragging. You're actually reporting what happened. It's true yeah. reportage, I call it. Yeah. This happened. It, it's reporting what happened with your client. That's not bragging. That's real. Oh, got it. And, and also, people are afraid to sell. You know, no. sell your stuff, people. Sell it. So the best tip is hashtag be yourself <laughs> and tell stories, not boring stories, stories of success, of yeah. something that's going to help somebody else. So content that actually helps people I love and, and start talking to people online without wondering, like, how do I talk to people? Just talk to them. And, and don't, don't make it that you're going to spam them and try to sell them something right away. But yeah. be real, be real, that they understand that the reason you're talking to them is potentially to tell them about what you're doing yeah. instead of pretending that you're not going to do that and then bait and switching because that's not cool either. So there's a way of being real that, of course, I'm a coach and, of course, if I'm in a conversation, well, maybe I'm sort of seeing if it's appropriate to, to talk about that not spam you right away though. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's so simple content conversation, see if they want to get on a call with you and tell them about what you do, highlight your value without lying to them or over promising or being weird and offering it yeah. and see what they say. That's how simple it is. I want to caution against oversharing. I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but I want, I want to give two instances of women that I personally know or knew who overshared about, physically violent relationships mm. and they got a lot of sympathy and support and then both of them ended up back in relationships with the physically abusive partner mm. and both of them ended up having children with the physically abusive partner and then eventually left the physically abusive partner again mm. but by the time the second time came around nobody felt sorry for them anymore no they didn't because it's, you know, even though it's harsh, human beings are like, well, why didn't you just fix that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So just my caution is do not overshare. There are just no, some it, things that no. are not appropriate to share. No, it's not appropriate. And it's not healthy that you feel it's a lack of security that yeah. you feel you need to tell me everything about your life. No. I mean, I was messy about, hey, you know, I was broke, single mom, deep debt. I mean, that's pretty private, right? Yeah. But then I'm not going to. It, but still, you're not giving details. No. I, I mean, Gabe, not icky, cringy detail. Yeah. yeah. It's here's the story. This wasn't working. This was going on and blah, blah, blah. And I'm pretty vulnerable about it, but I'm not going to go into my whole personal life and what's going on because I don't need to. Why would I do that? That's not a, a self-respect thing, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. and so social media is not your therapist. Absolutely. Oh, no. Absolutely you, not. Yeah. No. no. And yeah. And yeah. So just, just the, the caution. Yes, share. I mean, I, I'm, I have been very open over the last almost 11 years now about my breast cancer journey. I live with metastatic breast cancer. I don't shy away from it. 
I, you know, when I'm at chemo, sometimes I take a picture and say, here I am again. And, and you know, sometimes I don't, you know, but, right. but I don't keep it a secret. But no, I don't overshare. The, Nobody needs no. to know how I feel the day after chemo. No, no. You know, I mean, but, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just part of my life. You too can do this. If something crappy happens to you, you know, you get, you figure out a way to work well, around it. Well, the right? thing is you're actually helping people there. Exactly. Because you're helping them because it's like, look, a lot of people are going through that and I'm not going to hide it. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And, you know, that's a good share because you're actually helping people. You know, you're, you're yeah. helping them if they're going through it, that you're being cheerful about it. That could maybe change their life. Yeah. You no, know, I think that's wonderful. You know, I'm not saying everybody has, some people are private, you know, it's also a personality. There's nothing wrong with people not sharing when they have a health problem. Not the whole world needs to know, but you've chosen to do that. Therefore it's authentic. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's part of who I am. So why hide it? But don't, but I, I mean, I, Lord, there are so many side effects. There's so many things yeah. that could go wrong. There's so many bad mm. days. People yeah. don't need to know about, every, you know, mm. it's okay to share one bad day, but don't yeah. share 12 in a row, right? Because no, then it's a downer and it's yeah. not going to help your brand either because they're like, wow, this person always talks about how much pain they're in, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, a lot of people don't even know. I'm in pain right. every day. You don't need to know yeah. that. You don't need to know no. that. How's that going to help you? No, it's just going to feel so bad about you, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. I just want them to be, uh, I want them to take action on their own life because they heard my yeah. story. Right. right. Exactly. Well, so that's empowering, right? Yeah. So yeah. is there, is, we're, we, we, I cannot believe this. I feel like this conversation started 10 minutes ago and it didn't, <laughs> but is there anything that you want to talk about that we didn't get to cover? Oh, there's so much. Yeah, I do. You know what? Everybody needs to choose themselves. You need to just choose yourself. You need to just say, I I'm valuable. We're all valuable. I truly believe that. I have value. We all have value. This thing, especially women devaluing themselves because they're not like that other person. You want to feel bad about yourself? Start comparing yourself to other people. You can find somebody in three seconds who you can feel bad about. Or you could all do that, right? We need to say, I'm valuable and I am worthy and ready right now. There's two things in that worthy, worthy, but oh, I'm not going to spend 10 years to do something worthy and ready right now. We all have stuff going on. You have more than others. Probably we all have stuff going on. We have children or not. We have sickness or not. We have ailing parents or not. We have our own, you know, stuff going on, right? If we always put everything before ourselves, we will never be self-actualized. We will never have the lives we want. We will never help the people we want if that's what you want. So it's got to be, I am worthy and ready right now. What does that mean? Take one action, one step right now, just one. Now, guess what? You're on that journey. That's what I wanted to share. I love that. And it can be a tiny little step. Mm -hmm. It just has to be a step forward. One step. One, one step, thing, one step, and, and you can take baby steps. You can take big steps. You can take leaps, but you got to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Got to keep moving forward. All right, Jean Amlore, this is your moment of gratitude. For whom or what are you most grateful? I'm just. Well, I do a whole list every day. I'm just so grateful that I'm looking at this bay where I live, and that I have a really wonderful life, and it's filled with wonderful people, and I love my work, and I, I'm, you know, I do very well. And I can, I just, I bask in gratitude. I'm happy that I have food in my fridge. I'm so grateful for that. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the podcast for grateful micropreneurs building genuine, lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. To connect with Jean Amlore, head over to the show notes at gratitudegeek.com. This is episode 245. I've been your host, Candice Rodarty. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends. I know we can make it.